Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, April the 21st, 2021. It is currently 7.53 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church located in Ovalo, Texas. And you are listening to, well, you're listening to this podcast. Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Yes, once again, I forgot to play our intro at the beginning, but good morning. Welcome. Yes, this is the Theology Central Podcast. Yes, I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church in Ovalo, Texas. Yes, it is Wednesday, April the 21st. And yes, it is 7.53 a.m. Central Time, but something is desperately wrong outside of this building that I am sitting in right now. There is something desperately wrong outside because when I woke up this morning and I went out to start my car, I was like, whoa, what is going on? It was 32 degrees. Let me say that again. It was 32 degrees on April the 21st in West Texas. Something, something has gone horribly wrong. So um, I almost, I walked outside and I almost walked back in and said, that's it. Cancel everything. We're canceling church. We're canceling me going to the church. We're canceling me going anywhere because it's 30 two degrees outside, 32 degrees outside. Okay. I I know you, you, you don't, you don't seem too bothered by that fact. You don't, you don't seem to be too upset about that, but let me tell you, um, I, yeah, it's, it's my, my, you can tell from the sound of my voice. My voice is not even ready for this 32 degrees. So here I am. I made it. I, I drove all, all the way here through such horrible weather conditions. Now, no, it, there's no ice. There's no snow. I mean, it, it's sunny, but it's 32 degrees. So so right there, I mean, that that should have everything canceled, at least here in West Texas. But I, I, I demonstrated great bravery by getting in my car, driving through such horrible weather conditions. <laughs> my voice still isn't ready. And I, I'm here this morning to talk to you about a lot of important things because we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little time just trying to get my voice warmed up is what literally what I'm trying to do. But yeah, we are here and we're going to be talking about something that I don't like talking about. I hate talking about it because I pretty much loathe everything about it. We're going to be talking about politics. We're going to be talking about politicians and we're going to talk about Christians and Christians involvement in politics. So yes, um, I, I, I'm not a fan of this subject. I'm not a fan of this subject, but um, we're going to talk about it because a listener sent me an email about it. And guess what I always say? If you send me an email, if you ask me to talk about something, if you ask me to do a study on something, whatever, when you communicate with me, your communication, if, it, if I can turn it into a broadcast, it goes to the top of the stack. I always have a stack of things I want to do, but you, you're you the one who kind of guides the, the ship. You drive the car and someone has moved this topic to the top of the list. And so we're going to be talking about it. But before we do, let me lay a scriptural foundation here, all right? Because this email came because of the Bible study exercise I did on praising yourself. Now, I, look, first of all, I'm very grateful. And now I'm going to get serious, okay? I was joking around, but now I'm going to get serious. I was very, very grateful to receive an email in regards to one of the Bible study exercises. The Bible study exercises is something that I'm really, really passionate about because I I really want Christians engaged in learning, not just sitting there passively listening to someone teach them. So the Bible study exercises are designed where I kind of I guide you into a Bible study and then I hand it to you. And what I hope occurs is that you actually engage in the study and then it sparks a conversation that you're like, oh, I looked at this and what about this? And I thought about this. 
Then that gets me to go back to the very text that I already did the Bible study exercise on and then makes makes me re-examine it and re-look at it. And then hopefully it benefits you. And, and that's really my vision for it. Now, it hasn't been near as successful as I have hoped, but I'm not going to stop because I think they're very important. And I was extremely convicted by that Bible study exercise. It, I spent probably 24, 48 hours just going, okay, how, in what ways do I violate that? In what ways do I violate that? Um, and um, I'm glad that it sparked, well, this email and led to this now what's going to be a discussion in this particular case in regards to Christianity, Christians, Christian politicians, and, uh, and I think hopefully it will be beneficial. But let's lay that scriptural foundation. Sounds good? Let's lay that scriptural foundation. The Bible study exercise was based off a verse in Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 2. Proverbs 27, 2. Now, I know you're like, I just want to get, I want to hear you talk about Christian politicians. That's what I want to hear you talk about. I understand, but we need to lay the scriptural foundation. All right, here we go. Proverbs 27, 2. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. Proverbs 27, 2. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. The Bible, not only here, but in many locations, definitely speaks about this idea of not exalting yourself, not not making it about yourself, not giving yourself the preeminence in everything, um, that the idea is to humble yourself. God resisteth the proud. He hates pride. That we are not to praise ourselves. The idea of praising yourself is exalting yourself, making it about you, drawing all the attention to you. And Christianity is antithetical to that mindset, to that uh, attitude. It's against it. We even have the example of Jesus Christ who humbled himself. The eternal son of God took upon human flesh, took upon the role of a servant and was crucified and died for sinners. That's that's an, an, an um, the, the incarnation is an amazing example of humility. I mean, here is the eternal son of God, and then he places himself inside the womb of a, of a virgin and then is born as a babe. I mean, just, just trying to understand the incarnation is a sign of great humiliation. It's a, a sign of great humility. And that's the, and we are to have that same mind as Christ demonstrated. We read about this in Philippians chapter two. You can look at it for yourself. But Christianity has a, such a radically different approach. It's not about self. It's not about self-praise, self-glorification, self-exaltation. In fact, it leads to a very different way of thinking. And we read about that in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. Gospel of Matthew chapter 16. And this is what Jesus said, all right? In fact, if you, if you go back, Matthew chapter 16, uh, well, if you go back to Matthew 16, uh, you have this amazing, amazing conversation where, uh, where Jesus and Peter are having a conversation. Jesus acknowledges and, and testifies that uh, Christ, uh, Simon Peter answered Matthew 16, 16. Uh, uh, Simon Peter answered and said that, and speaking of Christ and to Christ, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He makes this amazing confession of faith, this amazing theological claim. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then it, starting in Matthew 16, verse 20, Jesus charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And then Jesus begins to teach them something very important and something very profound, all right? He may be the Christ. He may be uh, the, uh, the son of the living God, but this is what he says is going to happen. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he begins to explain to Peter here, here's what's going to happen, explaining to the disciples, here's what's going to happen. 
and immediately, this is, uh, this is just such a crazy verse, Matthew 16, 22, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Here is Peter rebuking the eternal son of God. It's hard to even comprehend what we are reading there. But if you think about it, Jesus just said, this is what's going to happen. Here's how things are going to work. And Peter, no, I don't like that. I don't accept that. That's not going to happen. He does it because Peter doesn't like something. So he literally begins to rebuke God in regards to it. And if you think about it, we're very similar to that. We want things to work our way. We want things to go the way we want to, our plans, our agenda, because I've said it so many times. Sadly, this is, this is the reality. We are the God we worship. The greatest idol is ourselves. Idolatry has, is, is a, great, a grave sin that people participate in all the time, and it's the exaltation of self. It is pride, self-will, self-desire. I want what I want. And that's why we, in many cases, try to take God and recreate him into our image because we're the God we ultimately want to worship. And then what happens in verse 23? But he turned, Jesus turns and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Wow, that's, that's a rebuke. Thou art an offense unto me for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You do not savor the things of God, but you savor the things of men. You're looking at this from a fleshly perspective, from a selfish perspective, from a human perspective. That's what you desire. Because again, we want to make ourselves the center of everything. We want things our way right away. And then look at this, verse 24, right? You've got to see 24 flowing from that, that conversation. Jesus said to his disciples, here we go. If any man will come after me, let him, number one, deny himself. So to follow, to follow Christ, we, it is a call to deny self. Number two, take up his cross. The cross was an instrument of execution. So die to self. And number three, and follow me. You are to deny self. Die to self and not follow self. That is the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview is not about finding yourself. The Christian worldview is not about figuring out who you are. The Christian worldview is you deny yourself, you die to self, and you do not follow yourself. Christianity is about the die, the, the basically the elimination of self. The elimination of self-desire, self-will, self-exaltation. It's the de- destruction of self. And then my identity is found in Christ Jesus. My purpose is God. My, my purpose is his glory, his honor. It's such a radical way of thinking. And you spend your whole Christian life trying, trying to think that way. And we fail over and over and over and over again because self continues to emerge. Self begins, shows itself. We see this over and over and over again. As Christians, we get upset when people say things about us or do things to us. Why? Because self is still very much alive. But if we have truly denied ourselves, died to self and not following self, so much of that, re- so, so many things that we do, we would not be doing if that was true. Self is the enemy. Self is the enemy. That, and, and that self, is, of course, is connected to our depraved nature. So Christianity is this so, such a radical different approach to life. And I don't know if we've ever truly understand that or truly embrace that. We can say all of the right words. Yes, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Christ. T- uh, take up your cross and follow Christ. We can say the words, right? We can get the answer right on a, you know, Bible study uh, quiz, on a Bible quiz. We, we can get it right, but living it is so radically different. We want to praise self. We want, we want power. We want recognition. We want, 
we want you know honor we want respect uh, we we get mad when things don't go the way we want it to we're self is such the problem now that is the scriptural foundation now you say what does that have to do with christians politics and christian politicians well i'm going to let the email speak from this point forward all right are you ready here is the email i received at 12:54 a.m. in the morning 12:54 a.m. in the morning i received this pastor trevor i have a question about christian politicians when christians run for office they spend months campaigning the whole purpose is to praise themselves to their audience to win votes they praise their past lives their accomplishments their abilities even their christianity they spend day after day month after month doing this is this compatible with god's will now the reason the person is asking this is in in light of the bible study exercise we did on proverbs 27:2 you're not to be praising yourself you're not to be exalting yourself the Christian politicians come along and they have a tendency to make it all about them. I will do this. I will do this. I will be your leader. I will be your champion. I will be the one who will do this and I will go to Washington and I will do this and I will do this. Now, they at the same time will say I will do this for you and I'm doing this for the good, but it, a lot of it becomes about them. Their name, their name recognition, their popularity, their fame, their power. I mean, politicians get elected. They say they're there for everyone else, but sometimes the only people who ultimately benefits from their election is them. They get position. They get power. They can uh, now start, be, you know, going from they can they can go on a, a the lecture circuit and make all kinds of money even after they leave office. Have a ghostwriter help them write a book. They, there's so many things they can do, and they bring in money, and they bring in money, and they bring in money. It's hard not to make it about them. Here's what I, w- I will say. It's always difficult. And, and there's a lot more to this email, but I just want to stop right here. Let's just, I just because I think there's another important foundation uh, that we need to lay here. So we've got Proverbs 27 too, and we've got Matthew 16. And those are very important in getting a Christian worldview about life. But it's always difficult when you, like I'm, I'm, I'm the outside. I've never been involved in politics. Never would be involved in politics. I hate politics. I despise politics for all kinds of reasons, and we'll talk about them in a minute. But it's always difficult when you're not the person and you're outside of a situation to accurately judge what is going on. We got to be very careful because the Bible would condemn wrong kind of judging. When I look at it, the whole situation does seem to be antithetical to the biblical approach. The biblical approach would, you would not be making it about yourself. You, you would, and I don't know how you accomplish that. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you, uh, I, I fight against that every single day. And look, I'm not a politician, but I, look, there was like, when I became a pastor, I'll never forget it. You know, I, and, I, and I'm still in the same church that I, you know, became a, I mean, this is going to be the church that I became the pastor in, and this is the church I'll die as the pastor in. I'm never going to go anywhere else. People constantly ask me, why not? Well, because why would I leave these sheep to go find other sheep? I've got sheep here. And if I was to leave these sheep, I couldn't leave these sheep until I found them and a shepherd to look after them. Obviously, you have Christ, but I'm talking an under shepherd, a pastor, because you don't leave them without out one. So, so this is where I'm probably always going to be. But I'll never forget very, I mean, I don't know if the church had even Maybe we were, uh, maybe you had already, uh, you know, I've, we, I've preached a couple of times. Um, maybe it just kind of accepted the, 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 you know, accepted to be a pastor. And it was very early on and they were talking about getting a sign for the church. And they started talking about the things to put on the sign. And they said, and we'll put your name. And I'm like, no, do not put my name. Do not put my name on that sign. Under no circumstance, do not put my name on that sign. Now, you may say, oh, because you're so spiritual. No, it's not because I'm spiritual. It's because I did not want this church to be about me. I wanted it to be about something 
other than me. I wanted it to be about the way we do things, the way we teach the scriptures. I didn't want it to be about me. I didn't want my name everywhere. I didn't want it I, because that's, that's the last thing I, I wanted. I, I, I did not want to do that. Um, when we were on Sermon Audio and they, uh, we were, some things we were trying to do on Sermon Audio and they said, well, you have to have your picture. And I'm like, I don't want my picture. I don't want my picture. I don't want my picture. They're like, well, you have to have your picture if you want. And I'm like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Why do I have to have a picture of myself? Why? That makes it about me. I don't want it to be about me, right? And then I had to put my name. And I'm like, I don't want my name. I, I don't want it like, you know, a sermon by here's my name. How about the sermon from Victory Baptist Church in Ovalo, Texas? Well, you know, I didn't want it to be about me. And now, again, you're saying because you're spiritual. No, not, I'm not saying it because I was spiritual. I'm saying it because I know how my ego can work. The next thing you know, it becomes like you say you don't want it to be about you. And then the next thing you know, it becomes about you. It becomes about your personality. The church becomes identified by your name. Right. I don't I didn't, I, you know, and and maybe maybe I had visions of grandeur that I thought the church was going to grow dramatically. But I didn't want it to turn around going, you know, Victory Baptist Church. Oh, that's the church. So and so is the pastor of I, I want I want people Victory Baptist Church. Who's the pastor there? I would prefer them never to know that I even exist. I want them to know that's the church where church history is taught. The Bible is taught. Theology is taught where they spend, you know, Hour after hour, Monday through Sunday, doing live broadcast. I, I don't. I, I don't try to even give my name during this podcast. I try not to give my name during this podcast. Not because I'm spiritual, but because I know my own nature. The next thing you know, it becomes about you. So, so it's very difficult to try to pull that off, right? It's very difficult. Um, you have to fight against it. But as a politician. It's all about the name of the individual. Your name has to be everywhere. Your accomplishments have to be plastered everywhere. It has to be about you or you're not going to get elected. If much as you want to say, no, it's about the policies. It's about the platform. It's about the agenda. No, so much of it is about personality, name recognition. These are things that they they look at to get someone elected. So I think in many ways it is antithetical, but it was, what I was trying to say is I struggle with this idea myself. I, it's, very, it's difficult for me to look at a politician and say, well, they're doing it the wrong way and to judge them. So instead of naming politicians, what I'm going to do is just say, I think the system creates a atmosphere that in many cases is very antithetical to the Christian world view. And I think everyone would have to acknowledge that. I think they would have to acknowledge that. So let's read this again. I have a question about Christian politicians. When Christians run for office, they spend months campaigning. The whole purpose is to praise themselves to their audience to win votes. They praise their past lives, their accomplishments, their abilities, even their Christianity. They spend day after day, month after month doing this. Is this compatible with God's will? It, it seems to be, uh, here's what, here's the only way I know God's will is what scripture says, right? I don't believe in finding out God's will through some like, I pray and I get a feeling. I don't, I reject all of that. God's will is outlined in scripture. I will say that that seems to be antithetical to a Christian biblical worldview. I will, I will be able to say that, all right? Is this a dangerous, slippery slope as a believer, well, I, I will say it's a dangerous, slippery slope as a believer spiritually when we start making it about ourselves. When we make anything about ourselves, we make life about ourselves. Now, we, we look, you don't have to be a Christian politician to do this. We, we can make it about ourselves when we wake up on a Monday and as soon as things don't go our way, we're fighting with our wife or our kids. And it's, it's really we're fighting because it's about us and our feelings and our thoughts and our desires. And they, it doesn't go our way. So we lash out. That's making it about us. So there's so many ways to do this. It is a slip, look, it is a slippery slope for every believer because it's a constant battle and trying to deny self, dis- killing self. And when I say killing self, not in a physical sense, but killing self as in a spiritual sense, like taking up our cross, dying to self 
and not following self. That is the struggle for a Christian every single day. If you're in a position where your job has to make it in a sense about you, yeah, that would be a dangerous, slippery slope for anyone. Is the whole concept of politics corrupt? Oh, now that is even a deeper question. Is the whole concept of politics corrupt? Well, I will argue on one hand, this is one of those I'm going to have to say yes and no. Yes, I'm going to say no in the sense that clearly government seems to be ordained by God. Romans 13, God ordains the powers that be. Government, and and, and when you say politics, that's connected to government. You have to have governmental organizations for societal stability, for, you know, for so many things. You got to have a, a working, functioning government or the, or the nation or the country or the area descends into chaos and war and anarchy until whoever can gain power and then they will establish some form of governmental control in order to protect their own power and then to bring stability back to the region. So I would say in some ways, when I say politics, I'm going to connect politics with government because that's the two are kind of synonymous in certain ways. Um, and that way, it's not, it's not corrupt. You need it. You have to have it. But politics in many aspects goes against a Christian worldview in this perspective. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Politics is politics is the process in which someone gets elected to political office and, 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 and to take some form of governmental control. I think this is where it becomes kind of corrupt from a Christian perspective. And you got to hear what I'm about to say because I'm going to offend a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians look at the world and they want to, they want the world to be changed. They want the world to be more godly, more moral, reflect biblical standards. They, they, they have all of these things that they want. And they want to accomplish that in many cases, not through the proclamation of the gospel, Right? To me, the way societal change is to take place from a biblical perspective is through the proclamation of the gospel. I preach the gospel, a person believes it. They become a Christian. In that process of becoming a Christian, they are to start thinking differently about God, about themselves, about the world around them, about morality, about everything. And they're, they're, they are now to strive to live that truth out in everyday life. That is how you change society is through the proclamation of the gospel. Politics is the idea of trying to change the world or to form the world through political power and force, through laws, through uh, bills that are signed, and it's done through a political means. I don't believe that's ever the biblical outline. Now, you could argue maybe in the Old Testament, but that was God running thing, running the nation of Israel as a theocracy. And even as the monarchy, they, in many cases, they were to still listen to, to God and God was still guiding and controlling. But once you get to the New Testament, those concepts are gone. Those concepts are gone. And it's kind of almost like, okay, the government's going to do what they do, right? We render unto them what is them. Yes, we're to obey and to submit to a certain level, but we we our primary focus is not on government, politics, getting someone elected, what they're doing. Our job is to go forth and to preach the gospel. We are to teach, baptize, and teach. We have the Great Commission, which is not political. We're to go into the world, no matter what the politics are, and preach and teach and disciple. That not, not, and it's not even about making it about us. It's about making it about Christ. We are to seek to glorify God, no matter who the politician is. Paul does not seek to get the Christians in Rome or anywhere else that he writes to try to fix the political situation. He doesn't even address the political situation other than to tell them to, to submit and obey. So I will say that the Christian, I think, I think politics and government is ordained by God. Yes, we pray that for a government that gives us as much freedom as possible, 
And when you're in a government governmental system where you can vote, you definitely are allowed to vote. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you're looking to politics, in a sense, to implement your vision of a Christian world, that is that is where it becomes corrupt. I hope I hope that makes sense. And I know I'm going to get, you know, so you're saying that we shouldn't vote for this and we shouldn't vote for that. I'm saying that if you're trying to accomplish that change through voting, that that's where the the process has become corrupt for a Christian because most of those changes that you really so want to enforce on people, you're trying to do so through law. How about do so through the preaching of the gospel? People say, well, I, I'm sick and tired of the LGBTQ agenda. Well, preach the gospel when people become saved. I think they're going to, they, they will ultimately move away from the LGBTQ agenda, right? Well, I don't like this and I don't like that. Preach the gospel. And you say, well, that, that's too difficult and that's too slow and I want change now. Well, you, you don't get to determine the way that change occurs. Po- political change is a change imposed by laws and restrictions, you can put all the laws and the world on, on depraved people and you can try to hold certain things back, but you're not changing the heart. If you don't change the heart, literally they will ultimately rise up and reject and rebel and turn against those standards because you're trying to impose the standard upon, uh, uh, you know, you're trying to impose biblical standards upon an unregenerate heart that only leads to rebellion. It, it doesn't work. You got to have the heart changed. You got to change their their perspective. So I, you know, um, is the whole concept of politics corrupt? I, I again, there, that's a that's a, a layered a layered question. That's a that's a question that requires many layers in order to try to answer. I think government is ordained by God and it serves a purpose, and it its biblical purpose is to punish evil and to do good. That's its biblical purpose, but it's never going to be followed out correctly because it's made up of sinful people. All right. Um, I'm getting uh, breaking news here. Let me turn down my volume. All right. Um, breaking news about things going on in, uh, in regards to the George Floyd case. And there's going to be a probe into policing in that area. So, all right. But um, so I think the government is there and serves a purpose in its biblical politics. Christians get involved into politics because they want to almost impose a Christian worldview upon an unregenerate world. That, I believe, is corrupt in that sense. That becomes a corrupt use of politics from a Christian perspective. All right? Now, I think the whole political game, there's so much. There, put it this way. Let's state this. Right, let's do this. No matter where you look, politics, the church, the family, guess what you see? You see corruption, right? And the reason you, it doesn't matter, police department, judicial system, no matter where, you're going to see corruption because every institution, every organization is made up of sinful people. So there's going to be corruption and there's going to be failure. I, I, will, I will definitely say that. I think many politicians have right they have probably right motives, but there's so much going on in that system that it's very difficult for things to work the way they're supposed to. I will say that. I think for the Christian perspective, what makes it corrupt is that we're trying to utilize, I, I believe, a fleshly, we're trying to use a fleshly means to accomplish a spiritual purpose. And I think that makes it corrupt for Christians. That's why I'm not involved in politics, don't like anything to do with politics. I, I just, I, that's not where, where the, I don't see that, no, I don't see anywhere in the New Testament anything, get, get, anything leading me to that. Now, I know I've heard, had Christians try to take scripture and try to show me this is where Christians are involved in politics. I'm, I'm just like, man, you're doing some twisting of scripture in ways that are absolutely insane. Um, I, I just I just don't see it. Go and preach. Go and teach. Disciple. Equip Christians. The focus is on the church, not on politics. The focus is on individual salvation. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth 
on him shall not perish and have everlasting life. You must be born again. It's an individual thing. And politics can't accomplish any of that. So I'm not going to say, I'd say the whole system has corruption in it, but so does the church. But the church is ordained by God. Government is ordained by God. But the church is where the focus is for the Christian. And government's almost like, it's there. Here's your responsibility as a Christian to it. And then, but to, your focus is on, this is not my home. This is, I'm a, I'm a pilgrim and a stranger here. I'm setting my affections on things above. All right, so let's read all of this again. I have a question about Christian politicians. When Christians run for office, they spend months campaigning. The whole purpose is to praise themselves to their audience to win votes. They praise their past lives, their accomplishments, their abilities, even their Christianity. They spend day after day, month after month doing this. Is this compatible with God's will? Is this a dangerous slippery slope as a believer? Is the whole concept of politics corrupt? All right, I've tried to answer each one of those to the best of my ability. The willing and dealing. Can a Christian be involved in politics and be living in God's will? Is it possible for a Christian to use tactics to climb up to the political ladder of power and still be grounded in God's word? I'm curious on what your opinion is on this. Now, look, I honestly don't know. I've, 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 I've asked myself this question before and struggled. Like if you're, if, if you're truly a Bible believing Christian and you get involved in politics, what would that look like? How would that work? Like you're trying to deny yourself. You're trying to take up your cross. You're trying not to follow yourself. You're getting into politics because you say you want to make the world a better place. And you're trying to, to make it about policies and not yourself. You're trying to make it about policies uh, that you think will help the, the, the people. You're trying to, you know, do what's right, equality. You're trying to, you know, you want justice for people. You're tr- you, you care about these very big principles. But, I, but for me, from a Christian perspective, I feel like, I, this is, and I, I don't know if this is going to make sense. I would, I would feel like that if I was a Christian and I got vo- involved into politics, it would take about 30 minutes and I would feel like that I was involved in the greatest example of futility that I, I feel like that 30 minutes into politics, I would be, I would be laying outside with my clothes ripped, sackcloth put on, ashes on top of my head, and I would be screaming, meaningless, meaningless, Meaningless. It would, I would sound like Ecclesiastes chapter one. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I think I would, that's where I would just, I would, I couldn't take it because so many of the things that you're wanting to try to fix, what are the root problems for, for, what's the root problem for all of the issues you're trying to fix? The biblical worldview would tell me it's sin. It's human depravity. So how are you going to fix it? How are you going to fix it politically? How are you going to resolve it? Politicians came up with the idea of the war on drugs. Well, how did that work out? Now, if you want to change people's perception about drugs and alcohol, salvation, salvation, that gives them a biblical, that now they have a a biblical framework to say, do not get drunk, right? That you, the Bible warns you about alcohol and, and the dangers of alcohol. So then you, you have a biblical spiritual reason to, to change your view on that and not to engage in certain behavior. That would be because of salvation. I think so many things the politicians try to fix, they can't fix because politics doesn't allow you to solve the depravity problem. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a, a place for politicians trying to create policies and laws. I just think that I would feel from a Christian perspective, it would just feel like that, I, that you're never getting anywhere. So can a Christian be involved? I'm, I'm assuming they can. I just don't know what it looks like from a biblical perspective. Like, how do you do that wheeling and dealing? How do you, how do you make it about self? But to be fair, this is the same, this is the same kind of problems you find in any career. Let, let me give you an example. 
and the United States military. I knew Christians in the United States military, and their goal was to get medals, recognition, and position. And, and sometimes they would be known as the people who like, they, they, they always did the right, the job at the right time around the right people. Like they were doing things to be seen and they really, it really became about them, right? They, they, they want, they wanted to, I, if I go here, like they were, they were trying to, to figure out how to advance in their career. Now that's not wrong, but it just really became about them. And one of the things we have to do in the military is you have to do, uh, you know, an, an evaluation performance report, I think an EPR. I, maybe they've changed the system. And uh, at that point, I think it was the five-point system. Get a, a, get a one on your EPR, that's a referral EPR, and, and you could your career could be in great danger. The, uh, the EPR went to your testing when you had to test for promotion. You had to take uh, actual test to be, get promoted in the military. Um, and that EPR score goes with your testing score. So if you get a one or a two on your EPR, your career is, I mean, your chance for advancement is just, there's, even if you can make, make it up on your testing, there's certain levels of, of rank that if they see the, that those past EPRs, you're not going to get promoted. It's, it's just, it's a really crazy system the way it all works. But one of the things on the EPR is they don't just evaluate your job performance, right? Hey, here's what you, here's what they did. They also want to see like, community involvement and that you have to do this and you have to do that. Well, one of the things that they, they look for is, so what do you do in the community? Well, when they found out that I was a pastor, they were like, oh, so you serve as a pastor. Okay. Are you getting paid? No, I, no, I'm, I'm not. I don't take pay from the church. Um, okay. Well, we want to put this in your EPR. How about how many hours a week do you uh, work for the church? I'm like, what? I'm like, no, I don't want that on my EPR. I don't want that my, my EPR because that's, my ministry is not to be to help me advance in my military career. Look, like, what is this? And so that there's little things like that. Like I'm making it about self. I'm putting it, they're, they're putting in my EPR. It's almost like praising, I, he's being praised for what he's doing for the church. I'm praising myself. And I'm like, is that, is that even biblical? Other people were like, there's nothing wrong with that. I think there are a lot of tough choices in every career about, what do you do? Another example. We, ha- we have major inspections, especially in the medical world, to in- ensure that you're accredited as a medical institution. And there's, there's, uh, there's all kinds of – I can get into all the accreditation things you have to do. Or not accredited – well, yeah, kind of in a sense an accreditation. Um, that may have used a different terminology, but I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. But things you have to do to ensure that your hospital can stay open. And so there are certain times, there were certain things that I would be like, well, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're fixing this just because the inspectors are coming. That's not how we typically do things. Well, like, well, that's the way you're going to answer the question if the in- inspectors ask you. And I was like, so you're telling me I have to lie? And so I would get into a major back and forth. And so what they ultimately started doing is I would be placed on man- on forced leave during inspections because they were afraid that I was going to tell the truth. And I'm like, what kind of corrupt nonsense is this? So I think every job, you are forced into ethical dilemmas at times. You're forced into situations like, okay, wait, what, what is the Christian way of handling this? How do I handle this? What's the right way? And I think it, it becomes a matter of conscience, a matter of you, of you trying to figure out. You don't want to just try to make a big issue. Like, and you've got to use wisdom here. You've got to be as... You know, as, as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove when it comes to, to the work world. Because you don't want to just run around going, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Because the work world didn't hire you so that you can, you know, demonstrate your Christianity. They hired you to do a job. But at the same time, you don't want to cross ethical lines as well. So every job has its own set of ethical dilemmas and challenges that every Christian has to try to, to, to figure out and you've got to work through. And politics is just another job where you have ethical dilemmas that you have to figure it out. How do you work that? I don't have an answer. 
And I don't think they're easy answers because it would require to say, here's the situation. Now let's look at that situation and think of what's the biblical way to do so. My major issue with Christian politicians is where they're trying to, in a sense, almost bring about a quote-unquote Christian nation, again, using fleshly means. Christian nation is brought about through salvation, not politics. That's my biggest issue. So can a Christian be involved? Well, we can be involved in all kinds of jobs, but there are ethical dilemmas that show up everywhere, ethical dilemmas that show up all the time. Um, when I was in the NCO Academy, and uh, which was what, how many, about almost 100 miles from here. I think, I think San Angelo is about almost 100 miles from here. And, um, and so I was, I was in the NCO Academy. You got all of the schoolwork to do, all of these projects you have to do. You got tests to take, speeches to give. Oh man, it's just, it's a lot, a lot of stuff you have to do. Well, in the midst of all of that, I was still on Sundays driving back I was driving back here to preach Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then turn around and drive back to San Angelo and then stay up all night Sunday in most cases to try to get all of my schoolwork done so that I could be ready for Monday morning. Um, and it was, it was crazy and it was a lot. It was, it was, it was a lot on me. Now, I, I, I hope, hopefully I did not complain. But when the school found out all the hours I was coming back here, they wanted to put this in some report about all the volunteer hours that the students in the NCO Academy gave to the community while they were in the NCO Academy to make the Air Force base look good. And I'm like, I don't want my numbers included. I don't want my numbers included. Now, some people would say, well, why not? Uh, because it was just like it was being used for something, it felt unethical. Now, I think they ultimately, I didn't have a choice and I had to give them my numbers and it turned into a whole thing. I mean, there was only so much, you know, I could or couldn't do because the reason they knew is I had to let them know I'm leaving the base. Uh, where are you going? I'm going back to my church because I'm going to be uh, preaching on Sunday. Uh, so, oh, you, and yeah, then it, oh, so that's, those could count for volunteer hours. <sighs> I'm not doing it so I can get volunteer hours. I'm not doing so I can get recognition. So um, there, there's always those kinds of ethical issues. I would say that politics, do politics have more? I can't, I can't say. I, so I, it's always easy when you're not in the situation to judge the situation. Um, I will say that there's probably good Christian men and women who've gotten into politics, hopefully for the right reason, hopefully, um, and found themselves, I, I would hope, at times feeling like vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Um, they probably get, in many cases, there's temptation about self-promotion, self-glorification. Uh, there's, there's that. There's probably, there's, look, that world has a lot of issues, all right? But you know what? Um, many ministers and many denominations it becomes very politics. It, there's a lot of politics there. There's a lot of ethical dilemmas in the ministry. The way it's supposed to work, if you, you got to find that first church, you get hired by that first church, then you want that first church to grow, right? You want it to be able to grow quickly. Like, you know, if you've got, you want to start small, you know, five people, 10 people. And then once you get up, like you go from five to 10 to like a hundred or 80, then you're like, peace out, gone. Because now you put that on your resume for the next church. I grew a church, and this is the way it usually, I grew a church from five to 80, right? Ooh, look, man, he, we, we want him. And so there's a lot of the same willing and dealing and, and politicking and networking, and, and you got to get along with this person. You try to meet this person at a conference, and you try to meet this person at a conference, and, and all of this stuff to try to go from one church to a bigger church to a bigger church to a bigger church. And there's a lot of the same kind of ugh, stuff that happens in ministry as well. Every job has these dilemmas built into it. Every job does. And I, I, you can, you know, people will contact you going, hey, I work in this situation, what should I do? I work in this situation, what should I do? And each one, I, I, there's, not a, there's not a blueprint that says this is what you, well, put it, oh, I may, may take that back. We have scripture, 
but scripture doesn't always, they give you maybe the principle, but the scripture doesn't outline exactly how you must apply that principle in that particular situation, if that makes sense, right? Some people will say, well, if I'm a Christian, I cannot have a job that requires you to work on Sunday. Okay, so then Christians can't be, can't work in the medical world or the fire department or police or military. Like, I, I don't know if I, see, I, I, I was in the military. I was in the military. And there were times I could not go to church on Sundays. Now, I've also told the story that what I, the way I try to handle the situation is in any situation where like it was not, we didn't typically work on a Sunday, uh, but they were going to have everyone come in on a Sunday to do you know, whatever, working on reviewing medical records for, for people's profiles and to see if, if they followed up on their profiles so they could get back on full duty or what, whatever the case may be. I don't want to go down that, you know, all the, the medical world rabbit hole that would bore you. Um, but they, for some reason, they'd pick, let's come in on Sunday because nobody wanted to ruin their Friday and Saturday to go out and party and, and do that. But they would you know, pick a Sunday, fine. And I'd be like, why do you have to pick a Sunday? Why? And so now I could say, I could act the fool and go, I'm a Christian. I'm not coming in on a Sunday, which usually never helps the cause of Christ or helps you as a Christian, just makes you look like that they, you think you're entitled because you're religious. So what I would always go and, and just find the boss and, and pull him aside and say, look, I understand. If you, if you tell me I have to come in on Sunday, I will come in on Sunday and I will do my job. But as you know, I go to church and I would prefer to be at church on Sunday, however, I'm not asking for any special consideration. Here's what I'll do. I'll come in Saturday night at 6 p.m. I will work from 6 p.m. all the way to you guys coming in at 7 a.m. So I'm willing to work 13 hours. And then when I when you come in, you can look at all that I've done. And I've done, if I did sufficient amount or if I did even above and beyond, then you can tell me you're good to go, and then I will leave, and I will go home and get ready for church. Now, if I really want to go to church, I'm willing then to sacrifice that. See, now that's how I'm, I'm trying to fulfill my obligation, I believe, to be at church, but I'm doing so in, in, in the most godly way that I think is possible, which is self-sacrifice. Uh, because if I sit there and just fight for my, my rights, my rights, my rights, my rights, then that that is exalting self and making me the center of the story. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you more of the work that you needed done. I'm gonna try to do so much. And there's sometimes I would come in and work as hard as I could for those 13 hours, so that when everyone came in Sunday morning, there would be as little to do as possible, so that they could possibly only have to work two or three hours. I would do everything in my power to make that happen. And guess what? The bosses loved it. Now they, in many cases, I think they took advantage of it. But you know what? Who cares? Who cares? If I get taken advantage of, remember, it's not about me. It's about, it's about something else. So I think every job requires, there's challenges, and you can try to accomplish those challenges in the most spiritual way possible or the most selfish way possible. And, and I think, so I, I, I think, I don't know if I have a good answer there. Let me, let me state it that way. I don't know if I have a good answer. All right. So they go on to say, um, So um, I'm, so I've given you my opinion, 53 minutes of my opinion, to the best of my ability. And it says, this podcast was really eye-opening. Well, thank you so very much. You don't know, even know how much it means to me. I don't get a lot of feedback on the Bible study exercises, um, I'm, which is at times very discouraging. It was very eye-opening to me because I had to sit there and go, man, you know, a lot of times I'll talk about this or I'll tell people about how many numbers we got. And I'm like, am I promoting myself? you know, maybe I am, you know, and, and so I, 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 you know, I, I gotta, I gotta figure out how all of that applies to me. It says, praising yourself is a danger. Yes, it is. It says Donald Trump actually helped me with this. I watched him praising himself all the time. It sickened me so much that I urgently pleaded with God to help me stay humble. Well, that's the right way to handle it, right? If you see something that someone else is doing that you think is so horrible, immediately use what they're doing to turn your attention back to you, right? Because you could sit there and go, well, look what Donald Trump was doing. Look what Donald Trump was doing. And there was a lot of things he said and did that, yes, we should speak against, but you always try to take the wrong you see in others as an opportunity to, to look deep into the wrong found within yourself. 
That is such an important principle. We always, everything should just reflect back to us and we look to ourselves because that's where we, that's where we have to begin. And I will just say politics has a, it's a, look, I hate everything about politics. I really do. I, I, I hate to say it. My, my personal feelings as politicians are more in it for themselves than me. Think of it this way. And I know this is selfish, and I, but I'm not trying to be selfish in the way I describe this. Just I just really want you to think about this. In my lifetime, if I go through all the presidents that I've you know lived through, um, but I will focus on you know starting in the 1990s. You know uh, there was there, there was Bush and then there was Clinton. If but every time the new president, you know the new campaign system or campaign season would start. I, I would hear, you know, oh, if this president gets elected, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. It's going to be the end of this. We're going to, we're going to lose our guns. We're going to lose our rights. The churches are going to be shut down. We're going to take the mark of the beast. We're going to be in FEMA camps. I mean, I, I mean, every time it's like the end of the world. You have to get this politician elected because if you don't get that politician elected, all of this is going to happen. But if you get this politician elected, this is going to happen and this is going to happen and everything's going to be better and everything's going to be wonderful. And it's, it's either, it's almost like every campaign season, the option is heaven or hell. That's literally the way it's almost sold. And I've lived through all of it. And you know what I've realized? In most situations, a new president comes in and a new president goes. And you know how much really changed in my everyday life? Very little. Very little. Now, I have, when I was in the United States military and Clinton uh, came in, um, when I first came in, we had like, it felt like you had 30 people to do one job, right? And then Clinton started getting rid of people left and right in the military. And the next thing you know, I'm like, wait a minute, I got to do that job, that job, and that job. Those used to be all full-time jobs. Well, now they're all those other jobs are part-time jobs and, and they all make up your one job. I'm like, how am I supposed to accomplish that? Well, military cuts, we've gotten, we've gotten rid of people. And you're like, what is going on? So in the military, I would see sometimes drastic changes that would impact me. But even then, Ultimately, my everyday life didn't change too much. Now, you, you know, definitely after 9-11, you know, there, <laughs> you know, major change, ma- major decisions were made, like the decision to go into Iraq, uh, which I was completely opposed to and said there were no weapons of mass destruction. But so those were changes that did impact me, but those were more work related. So there are some things that impact us when politicians get elected, but I think for the most part, I've always felt that the only thing that really changes is something changes for the politician. They now have position. They now, they, they now have power. They now have a, a lifelong ability to make money because now they can, they can, even after they leave office, they can end up on a news talk show talking about politics or they can you know, go to college campuses and give lectures. And, and it just seems like, the only person who really benefited from their time in office was them. I don't know if anybody else really, if, if anyone else really, it really, put it this way, the impact wasn't as great as everyone claimed that it was going to be. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't significant changes that can happen. Supreme Court appointments, you know, taxes. There, there are certain things, minimum wage. There are things that can have a profound impact. I just think that in many aspects, it's not as dramatic as everyone makes it out to be. And I feel like sometimes the only people who benefit are the politicians and the rest of us, our lives just go on pretty much as normal with maybe some minimal impact. And so I, I, that's why I just hate politics. To me, it's so much hype and lies and promises that no one's ever going to fulfill and and, and then saying things about your opponent that may not even be true, maybe be misleading. There's false information. There's propaganda. It's just so dirty and just so not Christian. And again, for me, you can't accomplish what you think you can accomplish in politics. The Bible tells us to approach it from a different perspective. So I will say that every person who is in any job 
You can tell me your struggles of trying to live out your Christianity in that work environment. Every job has its own ethical dilemmas and issues that you have to face. You, you, they're there, and you know what they are. And sometimes you maybe you don't maybe you're in a job where you re- rarely have any issues, and that's great. Praise God for that. And then there's times where you're like, man, what should I do here? And maybe you're asking your pastor, asking Christian friends, what should I do? Politics is the same way. I just think. The, 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 the difference is politics, I think, is seen by many Christians as an opportunity to accomplish, accomplish, they want to try to accomplish almost spiritual, spiritual things through fleshly means, and that, that never ultimately works. So just some thoughts, an hour worth of thoughts on this Wednesday morning my voice is much better than when we started, isn't it? Um, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was helpful. Um, I, I wanted that to be, what I wanted that to feel like, and I don't know if I accomplished this, was just me sh- trying to struggle with all the different layers. I, I guess I guess that's the thing. My approach to s- almost any question you ask is never really, I, I, I'm not... It's not that I'm opposed to like, here's definitely right, here's definitely wrong, because there are times there, there, that there's definitely, I mean, you have to point out the definite wrong and definite right. But I, I think that there are always multiple layers to an issue, multiple layers. And, and so I like to take a person through like, okay, well, what about this? And what about that? Okay, let's look at it from this way. Okay, well, what about this? And what about that? I'll try to look at it from so many different perspectives that when I'm done, you may sometimes feel like, well, you didn't really give me a true answer. No, but I try to get you thinking about all the different aspects to your question, all the different aspects to that issue. Because if I don't do that, then I'm not really getting you to think. Just turning on the mic going, nope, this is right, this is wrong, here's the answer. That doesn't, I think, benefit you. Because hopefully all those things I brought up, you're like, okay, well, that, oh, well, that's a point. Okay, well, yeah, okay, I could see. Okay, well, I don't know about that. That's what I wanted to do is take you on that kind of a journey um, and looking at Christians, Christian politicians, and Christians in politics. I hate the whole thing. And I'll just go ahead and say it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offend a lot of people. I don't vote. And the few, and if I, if I was to vote, it would probably be I, I would probably never vote for Republican or vote for Democrat, vote for Libertarian. I, I tend to be more from that perspective. Um, and I know that makes people mad like, you know, how dare you? You're not really a Christian. Well, my Christianity is not determined by me voting who you think I should vote for. And I think that most of the issues that you want changed are only ever going to truly be changed through the preaching of God's word and people being saved. And, and, and people say, well, how you, so you support abortion? I'm completely against abortion. But you know how many times I've been told that if we vote for Republicans, we're going to get rid of abortion? You know how many times I've been told that? You, you know how many times? Every time. And no matter if Republicans can be in control, and, 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 and control of Congress, the Senate, the executive branch, they can, they, can, they can have every branch of government under their control. And guess what? Abortions continue. Abortions continue. So I've been told that over and over and over and over and over again. It, it, and it continues. That, oh, so you don't care about this? You name the issue and, the, and, and guess what? Republicans come in and, and the issue remains because many times the issue deals with something deeper than politics can fix. And even if you can, even if you can ultimately, let's say, uh, let's say, uh, you know, Republicans come in and able to stop abortion, right? For how long? If you don't change the hearts of the people, the people will change their view and say, demand abortion and then put and then do everything they can to change it. Unless you change the hearts of people, you can impose every policy you think you want. But the people, if the if the if the if the views of the of the majority of people in the population aren't changed, they'll get what they want. You you can be against homosexuality all day long. 
You can be against homosexuality. You can try to get political office and try to impose laws against homosexuality. But if the people's views change on homosexuality, I'm sorry, that's a temporary fix and it, the laws are going to change. So, so you can go all day trying to impose certain things from a political standpoint. It can't accomplish the changing of the human heart. Israel had God's law. And then what did they do? They broke it every chance they got because the heart, the heart, that's where the issue is. Not saying that we, you, you, the politicians shouldn't try this and shouldn't do this. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I see it from a, a deeper level. Depravity, salvation, the gospel. That, that's why I'm like, I, I couldn't, I, look, I want to see the world change too. I just don't think, poli- I just think biblically the, uh, the Bible never points me to politics as the way to, to bring about that change. I want to see people, cha- I want to see abortion change. I want to see people's lives change. I think the preaching of the gospel is the way to do so, not through politics. So I just don't, I, that whole world, I just, and I know you're going to say, well, that's, that's the problem. If more Christians were involved, get all the Christians you want involved. Bring about every policy you want. I'm telling you, unless you change the hearts of the people, you only will create bitterness and rebellion and and a backlash against it like you've never seen before. That's just some of my thoughts. All right, I'll stop right there. You can email me all of your disagreements to newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'll be back on the air here shortly. God bless.